Hey now, welcome to another edition of the Inside BS Show. If you're like me, you always wanted to be a consultant. I know so many people who are corporate executives who are just working for somebody else and they can't wait to go out on their own and become a consultant. Even my dad, who worked for IBM for 40 years, when he retired, he became a consultant. So today, we're going to talk about consulting and we're going to talk about creating change in businesses from the outside. It's easier said than done, but we've got an expert for you. Today, we're talking to Alicia Harley, and she's the principal consultant, the founder of Prevention Advisory Group. She's going to give us some insight into her consulting journey. Please join me in welcoming Alicia to the Inside BS Show. Alicia, thanks for joining us. It's great to have you here today. Thank you. So glad to be here. All right. So tell me about your consulting journey, right? What mm. drew you into this fantastic business that I love so much? <laughs> well, you know, it's it, it's an interesting story, Dave. I, um, I was at a crossroads in my career. I had worked in public health for many years and uh, and then in clinical research for a period of time. And so a friend gave me this book called What Color Is Your Parachute? Now, I don't know how many people read the book anymore. I know that a lot of people go out to the website, but it told me that there were two career choices that would be great for me. One, either become a midwife or <laughs> <laughs> become a consultant. And guess which one I chose? <laughs> you don't want to be birth and babies. <laughs> no. no way. Not for me. That is so interesting. What? I, I'm just, I'm fascinated now. What? What what answers did you give that could have possibly <laughs> led them to think midwife? Like, were you well, healthcare? I get okay, yeah. but like, how, where does that come from? Did, did you did you do you know where that came from, or was it a shock to you as well? It was a complete shock to me. It was totally unexpected because. I can't imagine that anyone would want me in the room while they're going through one of the most beautiful experiences of their lives because I would be saying, okay, let's get it done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let no. me tell you. <laughs> I was in the room where it happens a couple of times and the, the, the byproduct was better than the process. Let's just put it that way, okay? So, you know, and because it was my own kids, I was willing to to, you know, kind of stick it out there. But God bless women, because if it were up to men, the species would die <laughs> off. OK, there ain't no man going through that. I'll tell you that right now. All right. So so you chose consulting instead of yes. midwifery. Right. Yes. And uh, and it was the right choice. So now let's talk about your firm and what you do. And then I want you to sure. tell us you know, what the process was like when you first got started. So explain to people what you do first and then tell us sure. what, what the process was like when you first got started. Because believe it or not, there are a lot of people who listen to the show that may be professional speakers and they want to add consulting to their business model. Mm. So your your case study is going to be a good one for them. So tell us about your firm first. Sure. So Prevention Advisory Group, we help nonprofits and social entrepreneurs transform their business or grow. Um, in instances where they're at a turning point or are unclear which direction to go, we help them take their abstract ideas and move into making an impact for people and, and their real lives. And so we've been doing this for a little more than three years. But when I got into consulting, I have to be honest with you, as someone who was leaving public health, I wanted to learn the business, and so I went to one of the big management consulting firms here in Chicago called Huron Consulting Group. It was a great experience, worked with a great number of people and really learned the business. And if you don't know Huron Consulting Group, they are very focused on healthcare and higher education. And so for nine years, I worked with universities, academic medical centers to help them uh, improve their research and build their operations. 
And so when I left Huron, I spent a little bit of time at a local academic medical center and then started this practice on my own using a number of those skills that I had learned around change management, uh, transformation, software implementation to, to help our clients. So it's been a great journey. I have learned a lot and met a lot of really amazing, wonderful people through the process. So what was the biggest, um, what was the biggest surprise for you when you went out on your own? Because you knew how to be a consultant. Obviously you had done it before, right? So that was not a surprise. What was the biggest surprise for you when you went out on your own? That, I knew nothing about sales and marketing. <laughs> After having been a consultant in a, in a firm where I felt as if I had to do my own sales and marketing anyway, you don't realize when you're on your own how having that big engine and brand name behind you generates natural business on its own. And so uh, the biggest thing that I had to learn was how to market myself in a way that wasn't aggressive, but was what I had been doing for years, which is helping people solve the problems that they have. Yeah. So um, you get out on your own, right? And you're um, you're you know you're good at what you do, and there's probably you know a lot of people who know that you're good at what you do, but not enough to give you the you know the initial business that you need to you know the cash flow to get started because that's what happens with everybody right so what did you do and this is going to be really helpful to people who are thinking of starting out what did you do to get the work in the door when you first started so i started of course with the relationships that i had and i really thought that one of my former clients was going to be my first sort of interim staffing gig to give mm -hmm. me the stability uh, in the income. And it turned out that that did not happen. So I, I did what any scrappy consultant will do. I went on Upwork and Fiverr and <laughs> I got those small uh, jobs in order to put food on the table until I was able to develop those relationships um, further and for people to see that I was going to be out there now. Of course, about six months into this new business, uh, the pandemic happened. And those new contracts that I had gotten signed and was ready to start were put on pause. And I was also in the process of starting my speaking business. Uh, but luckily, I have a background as an epidemiologist. And during the pandemic, epidemiologists were in high demand. So I pulled that skill out of my tool belt and I went on the, on the virtual road. Um, speaking to audiences about COVID-19, what it meant, what vaccines are, how they're, you know, all of those kinds of things. So that kept me busy for most of 2020. And then in 2021 and 2022, I've been able to get back to management consulting and uh, and helping people develop their strategies, priorities. That's great. Like. Wow. Thank yeah. goodness you were an epidemiologist. That's, I mean, I can't <laughs> think of a better person to, to talk to during the pandemic than an epidemiologist. Has it surprised you? Um, you know, without without getting into the realm of the political, has it surprised you uh, all of the, you know, crap, for lack of a better word, around, you know, vaccinations and the, you know, the science and the research as a as a person of science? Has it was, was that a surprise to you? Because as a as a non-science guy, I was shocked. Like, what do you mean you don't want a vaccine? Like, was, was it a surprise to you as a science person, as a scientist? So, yes and no. Uh, yes, in that I never thought the numbers of people that would be nervous about getting vaccinated or, um, under, you know, believing that COVID was real um, would be a, a challenge the way that we had. I don't think that we've ever seen anything like that before. But there have always been anti-vaxxers. You know, when I was the uh, director of school health for Chicago Public Schools, the vaccination rate for the entire district and it has about, you know, at the time, there were about 400,000 students. And so the vaccination rate was about 87% when I started. And we worked really hard and educated and communicated with people to get that up to about 98%. But of course, there's always that 2% 
that are either anti-vaccine or, um, or you know, for medical reasons I mean, reasons 2% or whatever. would be a miracle at this point. That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? So I never thought that we would be at, you know, 30, 40%. Uh, of people who have concerns. But in their defense, there has been a lot of confusing, conflicting information out there. And the big surprise for me was that um, the Centers for Disease Control would falter and missed up the way that they The did. messaging. Yeah, the messaging was bad. Yeah, I, I tell people all the time, I participated in a vaccine trial and it was it was very, on, very early on. It was it was, you know, nine, 10 months into the pandemic. I, you know, I was getting a shot in my arm and the education I got before participating in that trial was fantastic. It was, you know, hours and hours. They gave me a bunch of stuff to read and then they brought me in for like a four hour education session. And then they made me go home and think about it to make sure I still wanted to participate. <laughs> and then I came back and they, you know, uh, uh, doctor, uh, scientist, uh, nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, all in the room willing to answer mm. any questions I had, no matter how, nice. you know, ridiculous or and it seemed like if if they had done 10 percent of what i got with the general mm. public I, right. i'm willing to bet that you know not everybody but a lot more people would have felt comfortable um you know getting being involved in the process and the biggest thing that uh that i discovered was you know, one of the reasons why there are years of um, of the, why, why the study for most vaccines takes years is because it's hard to find enough people in the sample population who are at risk for getting the disease. I mean, it doesn't do any good for you to give a vaccination to a person who's not exposed to the disease. Well, in a pandemic, if you pick the locations correctly, basically everybody's exposed. So the reason the process can be accelerated is because there's so much virus around and there's so much exposure that we don't need years to expose people to this. They're going to get exposed tomorrow. I mean, and my study took place in Florida where basically mm -hmm. everybody was exposed all the time from day one, you know, so it just was, it, it's, that to me was a tremendous, and, and I went into this predisposed to wanting to believe in the science anyway, but that was something that even I didn't think about as somebody who was, you know, pro the process to begin with. So I, I, I think it's just, it's just one of those things where the messaging was bad from the beginning. Um, you know, there's still, there's still not enough education out there. We still can't educate people enough. It's just gonna. It's just gonna end up taking time. Uh, I mean, I think it's just gonna end up taking time. And you know, at this point, there's probably a, a good amount of natural immunity. So you know, hopefully, knock on wood, we're we're out of the woods. All right. So Alicia, here's what I want to do. I want to ask you to uh, describe um, a scenario. Give us a kind of a case study of bringing change to a, to an institution that's reticent to change because a lot of people who are who are out there are are going to want to hear this because it's it's not an easy thing to do and it's it's kind of the foundation of your business so i want you to talk about bringing change to an organization that has always done things a certain way for years and years and i want you to do it in just one minute because i need to remind people that the inside bs show is brought to you by sandrowski Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. They are a financial service and CPA firm. And for over 35 years, they've been helping people all over the United States with complex accounting and with accounting that is designed to help privately held companies and families of wealth. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, families of wealth, I don't need to listen to this. No, you really need to listen to this because here's the thing. We can learn, we can all learn a lot from the way families of wealth handle their business and handle their money. So Sandrowski has an area of expertise um, in the family office space. And what that means very simply is affluent individuals, affluent families, or people who have a windfall in, uh, you know, a financial windfall, they form what's called a family office to manage their investments. And I'll give you an example. I know uh, a gentleman who owned a medical billing company and his medical billing company did very, very well. He sold a third of his business for $100 million. And, you know, one day he wasn't a high net worth individual, the next day he was. So he gets this windfall of $100 million and he only sold a third of his company. So he still had the other two thirds left to sell. And now he's getting pitched left and right for people to invest their money. 
So he doesn't want to hear these pitches. He doesn't want to evaluate them. He doesn't have time to do the due diligence. So he goes to his financial advisor and his financial advisor is like, hey, look, man, I can tell you where to put your money, but I'm not going to evaluate this stuff. You need to form a family office and hire people to, to uh, evaluate investments for you. In addition, once you form a family office, we can present as the financial advisors better investments to you because you'll have qualified professionals who will look after your interests and they will be independent of us just bringing these investments to you. So he forms a separate company called a family office and they go out and they evaluate investments for him. They get him involved in better investments that aren't available to the general public. Where does Sandrowski come in? They come in in the foundation, in the formation of the family office. They also come in in evaluating the people you're bringing on board. You see, Sandrowski wrote the book on family offices. They literally wrote a textbook on forming a family office so they can help you bring professionals in. They can help you audit your financials. They can also help you look at the valuation of some of those investments and determine what makes sense and what doesn't. If this sounds like something you'd be interested in, or you're a professional advising somebody who might be interested in this, I want you to give them a call. 866-717-1607, 866-717-1607. Sandrowski Corporate Advisors, they're a CPA firm with a different perspective. We're also brought to you by My Revenue Roadmap Guide. If you want a business development system designed to help you grow your business based on relationships, I've got it for you. This is the marketing plan you've been waiting for. Go to revenueroadmapguide.com download that guide for free today. It's my gift to you for watching and listening to the show, revenueroadmapguide.com. It's the same business development plan I use with my clients. I customize it for them. You can customize it for yourself. Revenueroadmapguide.com. Enter your contact info, download it for free today. We're talking to Alicia Harley. She's a principal consultant and the founder and owner of Prevention Advisory Group. You can reach out to her at 312 288-8628-312-288-8628. Okay, Alicia. So change, right? Everybody hates it. You you go into a uh, you know, a business that has always done it this way, and you know you can help them make money, save money, reduce risk by doing things differently. How do you how do you get them to buy into the change? Right. So of course there has to be some big reason for them to make the change, right? Oftentimes I'm unable to convince them that they need to change, but when they're ready, you know, when they come and they say, okay, we know this isn't working, you know, help us figure out what will work. So uh, there was this one organization that I've been working with for a little more than seven years. They had always created very specific job descriptions for their teammates and, and allowed people to go deep in any particular role. But then when that person would move on and leave to go somewhere else, then they had this big fill, this big hole to fill and no one else on the team could do their job. And so my suggestion was, is why don't we take a different approach to hiring, to filling roles? Now, of course, you've got people that are in these very specific roles now, and you're not going to really be able to change that. But if we think more about skills rather than functions and create our job descriptions sort of based upon, you know, what it is that you need completed, we did a complete organizational redesign for them, redid their job descriptions and redid the way that they went to market, helping people understand you're a good fit for this role if and you're not a good fit for this role if and uh, in their hiring process and really created a dramatic change for them. And it allows people to do different things sometimes and not feel like they're stuck in a rut. So that was very successful for them. Terrific. But question. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's let's talk now about um, your competitive advantage in your business. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. what makes you different from other people who do what you do? So so we don't come in and tell people what they need or what they have to fix or what has to be done. We make suggestions. We work in partnership and in collaboration with our clients. I have learned over the years that the thing that people hate most from a consultant is someone who comes in and thinks they know it all about them without developing the relationship and really getting a deep understanding. So we really get to know our clients. We listen to them and we respond to what it is that they need. Okay. Um, 
As I mentioned earlier, we have, uh, there's a lot of people who listen to the show who are professional speakers and maybe they want to mm -hmm. add consulting to, uh, to the mix of their speaking. You know, you, you strike me and maybe I'm wrong and you can correct me if I am. You strike me as, as a consultant who also speaks rather than as a speaker who consults. Is that, would you say that's accurate? Okay, what do you, so let's talk a little bit about speaking and how you use speaking um, to enable your business. You mentioned, and I love the, the, you know, the epidemiology example, you know, pandemic, epidemiology, let's get, let's get the word out that I can speak to people on this subject. Fantastic. Great. How else do you use speaking to enable your consulting business? Yeah, so it's really about the, the topics that, um, that I go to, to market with. Uh, so this past Sunday, uh, did a number of video recordings around leadership and around change. And, you know, it's really interesting to me. I don't know how you feel. I'm not, a, I'm not the biggest fan of Oprah, but one of the things that Oprah said makes a lot of sense to me. She said, if you talk about it, then people will ask you about it. <laughs> so she had to stop talking about Stedman because she didn't want people to keep asking her about Stedman. So, uh, so if you speak about what it is that you consult on in a meaningful way, that's been my experience. It's been very uh, helpful for me. So when I talk to people about leadership, when I talk to them about change and how it is that we can help them without selling from the floor, but really providing a service, really giving people information that they can use and walk out of that room being able to do something with, uh, I find that it leads to people reaching out, wanting additional information, and sometimes they decide they want to hire me as a consultant, which is always fantastic. Yeah. And do you, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, do you uh, go looking for speaking engagements or do you promote your consulting services and people say, hey, we need more information about this. Will you come in and, and do a session for my team? It's like a chicken or the egg thing, right? Which 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 do you do? Do you do you go out and market the talk or do you market the consulting and the consulting leads to the talk? You know, that's a, a good question. I would say more often than not, the talk leads to consulting. Yeah. Not that the consulting leads to the talk. I, I Clients don't often think of me as a speaker, but people who see me as a speaker can visualize me as a consultant. And so I think it is really important uh, if you're in the speaking business and you want to get into consulting, make sure that your website is very clear about what services it is that you can offer and how you can add value to them. Because if people hear you speak, they'll want to learn more about you. They'll go to your LinkedIn profile. They'll go to your website. And so like you mentioned earlier, if you have free guides that you're going to give away or tools that you're going to provide to them, get them to your website and let them know about your consulting services. And that's a way of beginning the, the relationship. I, my my experience is that speaking is my best lead generation activity, um, but it's what you do with those leads once you get them. Yeah, no, I, uh, I'm, I'm a hundred percent with you. I, you know, for years I spoke between 50 and 70 times a year and that was like my number one. I mean, you can imagine that was my number one lead generation strategy. And when you're speaking that much and traveling, you can also do some writing, but you really don't have time for a lot of other business development activities. Then the pandemic happens and the, you know, the speaking, really the speaking, the breaks got put on the speaking because I'm not an epidemiologist and, you know, nobody, nobody was interested in hearing me talk about the virus. That's for sure. So, um, you know, I had to come up with other options and they were always there, but I always, you know, if you're, if you can get speaking gigs and speaking gigs lead to business, then you're going to just keep speaking. And for me, I never, I, maybe I shouldn't say this in a, in a forum where people can hear it, but I never let price be a barrier to me getting in front of the right audience. Right. So if there was, if there was a good audience, I would go there. I didn't care what the fee was because I knew that there was going to be, you know, revenue that came on the back end from that speaking engagement. Well, I was in the same boat that a lot of other people were where that was my number one lead generation activity. And all of a sudden, nobody was going to put me in front of an audience anytime soon. My friends in the hospitality industry were telling me, oh, this is not coming back until 2025. So I was like, well, I'm not going to be able to make it to 2025 without any business. So I need to figure out a way to uh, generate some, some additional leads. And, you know, 
necessity is the mother of invention, so it, it's it's worked out just fine. But give us give us some tips, uh, Alicia, for the people who are out there who are speakers and they're excited because events are happening again. You know, what's your what's your best consulting for those folks who think it's going to be back to business as usual for speaking? What advice can you give them? So I think for for those people who have some celebrity, I I think that business is coming back like gangbusters, that they're really seeing uh, a lot of uh, a lot of business come through the door. For those of us that don't have celebrity who um who are are more experts in our field or uh, supporters, you know, more technical people. I think part of what we have to do in this environment is to get out into the public square. It's doing podcasts like this or getting on YouTube and uh, creating more videos. You've got to create content so that people can find you. And if we are being paid a significant fee to speak, then it's really about delivering on that. Now, can you negotiate with who it is that you're speaking with to add consulting onto that? Of course. If there's that opportunity, someone wants you to come and talk about leadership, have the conversation with them. Well, I have a challenge that I do in addition to uh, the speaking and, and the keynote can be the beginning of a relationship or uh, the beginning of a workshop series or, you know, annual meetings. There could be some follow up to go along with um, with the keynote or that talk. But then the other part of that is. If we're not getting a significant fee, just like you said, getting the opportunity to get into an, uh, an audience of the right people, your target audience for your consulting, and that the leads are worth so much more than the fee. And so there are times when I will do association conferences and the like for free because I know that I'll be right in front of a large audience of leads. And my thing is, is that you got to take it. You got to be willing to play the long game. Right. I mean, I, you know, uh, I, I can get business at a, at a kid's birthday party. So, you know, put me in front of a room full of people and it's going to work out as long as they're the right people. Right. In addition, there's a credibility element of it to, to it, too. Even if, you know, half of the people are the right people, you can, if you negotiate it the right way, you can use the association's name in your marketing, featured speaker for yes. the association of, the International Association of Tow Truck Drivers or whatever, which is actually <laughs> a gig that I did at one time, believe it or not. Um, it was probably a fun one. <laughs> it was It was a good, it was a good gig. It was a, it was a very good gig. Um, you know, but you can use it for credibility purposes. You can bring your own video team and if the association will let you, you can video it. If they're videoing it, you can negotiate a copy of your speech as a result so right. you can have a nice speaking reel so there are a whole host of ways that that can provide value so i uh i like your approach i think it's i think it's a good one i think people need to remember that speaking is essentially a form of media it really isn't a business i mean it's a business for retired generals and corporate executives mm -hmm. but for you mm -hmm. and me it's a form of media it's another way for us to get the word out there about who we are and what we do and that's the way we should really treat it. All right. So, Alicia, I want you to think about three things we should take away from our time together. Three key things. Before we do that, um, before you think about those three things, I need to mention this. I think you and I have something else in common. So, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, you have a dog and the name of your dog is... Cassius Clay. Okay. So, <laughs> the, one of the best things that ever happened to me in my career was back when I was 18 years old and I was a bellman in a hotel in New York City. Oh, I'm standing wow. I'm standing uh, in front of the front desk, uh, perfectly straight in my like spaceman type uniform. And I see a, an older African-American gentleman and a, a beautiful woman on his arm shuffling across the lobby. And it is Muhammad Ali. And I am a wow. huge boxing fan. So I run over, I'm like, champ, can I help you with your bags? And he kind of nods a little bit. And his, his wife says, absolutely, thank you so much. I bring him to the desk, check him in, I bring him upstairs. Um, I go to get him a bucket of ice. I show him how to use the um, the air conditioning. And I said, is there any is there anything else I can get for you to uh, to the champ and his wife? And they, and they both said no. And um, 
they uh, they they gave me a nice tip and I said champ I have to tell you it's such an honor to bring you up here I said just a few weeks ago I uh, was the guy who had the privilege of escorting Mike Tyson in through the back door. We had to have somebody who waited because at the time Tyson was huge. He was, you know, he was the heavyweight champ. And I said, and I was the guy who escorted Tyson into the building and up to his room. Um, and, you know, I was talking to him about who he thought the greatest of all time was and guess who he said. Now, at this point, Ali had Parkinson's, so he didn't he didn't really talk, but it wasn't as advanced as it was later on in his life. This is probably 30 years ago. And so his wife said, well, who, who, you know, who did he say? And I said, he said you. And <laughs> Ali went like this, like, you know, like come closer. So I, I went closer to him and he he just had this twinkle in his eye and the corners of his mouth turned up and he looks at me and he goes, and for those of you who are listening, I just got into a fighting stance and it was, and then, and then he, um, he opened his jacket and his wife reached into his jacket pocket and he had a little picture of him standing over Sonny Liston, the, the famous pose. And it was the moment of my professional career to this day. I have wow. not had a moment that was better than that. I left that room and I was on top of the world and it was just the greatest moment. So good on you for having a dog named Cassius Clay. Those of you who don't know, you need to look up the name Cassius Clay and you'll figure out why this story is so resonant. All right, so Alicia, you're gonna give us three things that we should take away from sure. our time together. Those three things in just one minute. I, I gotta remind people, if you need help, with business valuations or litigation support, Sandrowski Corporate Advisors is the firm to call. Why? They've been doing it for over 35 years. And when it comes to litigation support and business valuations, you need someone who can not only do the valuation well, you also need somebody who can testify in court in a way that's so easy, even a judge can understand it. And because Sandrowski has been doing this for years, they can take complex financial information and break it down so that a judge or a jury can get it. If you need help with this, I want you to call this number 866-717-1607, 866 717 1607 Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. They're a CPA firm with a different perspective. Also, don't forget, if you haven't downloaded already, I want you to download your Revenue Roadmap Guide, my free guide to business development. It's only free because you're listening and watching. So thank you for doing that. Go to revenueroadmapguide.com, enter your contact info, and you can download it today. We're talking to Alicia Harley. She's the principal consultant at Prevention Advisory Group. You can reach out to her at 312 288 8628 312 288 Alicia, what should we take away from our time together today? So after that last story, I just have to use a Muhammad Ali approach to All these right. three things, right? So if you need help getting from abstract to impact, give us a call. If... <laughs> I like if, it. I like where this is going. <laughs> All right, bring it home. Let's go. I know. Uh, number two, if if you if you have a challenge, at the end of the day, all I have to say is we'll make your day. Okay, I think that's as far as I can go on the Muhammad Ali uh, sort of jokes. I was trying really hard on the fly. Not so good. On the spot. Not so I mean, come on. You did great. That was awesome. Way to go. <laughs> But thank you so much for the time today. I really, you know, for the speakers that are out there, if you want to get into consulting, feel free, give me a call, reach out. I'm here to help. And Lori Guest, a member of uh, National Fantastic Speakers Association, speaker. has, yes, has some amazing tools out there to talk about the same approach. So I've really enjoyed talking to you today, Dave, and uh, love your Muhammad Ali story. Oh, that is, yeah. Thank you. I have to tell my husband that. He's oh my the gosh, Muhammad it's uh, the yeah. highlight, the highlight of my career. Our guest today is Alicia Harley. You can reach out to her at 312-288-8628. 312-288-8628. Alicia, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a privilege to have you on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All righty, folks, that'll do it for another episode of the Inside BS Show. We will be back here again tomorrow with another great interview. Until then, here's hoping you make a great living and live a great life.